Welcome to M&M Chat, the D&D interview show with me, your host, Jared Bornigal. I'll be discussing, I don't know, stuff with people that I find interesting. And today I have with me Aaron Reynolds. Aaron, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell everybody what you do? Yeah. Hey, Jared. Thanks for having me. Uh, I am uh, a children's book author. Uh, I've written tons of uh, picture books as well as graphic novels and um, some middle grade uh, stuff for like second through sixth grade. And um, and I have a passion for D and D. Uh, and one of my new series out is very D and D centric. And uh, so. Uh, that probably is what brings us together today. <laughs> yeah, I believe it is. Now, have have your uh, writings always been D and D centric, or is this the first time you've you've really crossed over the two loves? Yeah, this is the first time. I uh, I have dreamed of writing a fantasy for years, and um, I for years and years and years uh, wrote picture books. I've written picture books that. Um, listeners who have younger kids might be familiar with like creepy carrots and creepy pair of underwear. Um, those are both um, New York Times bestsellers and and so some of my more popular books, but probably about 45 different picture books over the years. But um, over over the years, kids, uh, I visit a lot of schools and kids asked me, um, you know, fifth graders and stuff ask me, Aaron, we love your picture books, but dude, we're like older now and we like chapter books now. And <laughs> like, like, like we need some more Aaron Reynolds love in our lives. Cause uh, there's, you know, you don't write for, for our age. So, and I was like, yeah, you're right. That's maybe I need to branch out. And so when I started thinking about uh, writing for, you know, older elementary kids, um, kind of D and D came to my mind, writing a fantasy came to my mind. And so, uh, yeah. And so that, that, that seemed to be the perfect opportunity to get into it. Yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so then, you know, going back to earlier in life, uh, what, what got you into tabletops in the first place? Man, I, I go way back, Jared, like I, um, all right. So my first, uh, experience was, I'm going to take you back to 1980, uh, summer of 1980. This was the summer after my fifth grade year. And uh, I was hanging out at my friend Andy Cook's house. And we were just hanging out free from school. Summer spread out before us like a, you know, like this never ending lovely thing. And um, we were hanging out at his house, I think, playing Atari or something. And uh <laughs> And uh, his older brother, who was like seventh or eighth grade, comes in and is like, guys, I need you to come. Pl uh, I, I'm playing this game and I need more players. So come on. And uh, I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. What? I, you know, like right. Strictly Go or Monopoly or something. Like, I don't. Um, and we sat down and began to create characters for this game I'd never heard of called Dungeons and Dragons. And uh it was absolutely life changing. Um, that I, I still remember he was taking us through Keep on the Borderlands. I mean, this was back, you know, but, I mean, this is OG D and D first mm -hmm. edition. And um, I, I remember going into the first cave, and he told us we saw kobolds, and I'm like, "What the heck is a kobold?" Right. And uh, I just fell in love with it, this idea of a game you could play that was immersive storytelling that you kind of invented the story as you went. It was really the first time I had ever come in contact with the idea that maybe I had stories to tell. Like I'd never experienced anything like this. Sure. So needless to say, we were, I, I was hooked immediately. And that summer, we played from sun up to sundown every single day that summer. I went. I remember I got up at breakfast, went over to Andy Cook's house, and we played all day long until my parents made me come home for dinner. And uh, I was hooked. Uh, I was. I was. I was hooked. And I still. I'm proud to say I still to this day that Christmas, uh, Christmas of '80, I got the Monster Manual for Christmas. Nice. And I still have my original monster manual from 19 Christmas of 1980. Oh man. Uh, still not just the original printing, but like the one I sat for hours and hours and weeks and months on end, just pouring through. So 
um, yeah, I was pretty hooked uh, pretty quickly. That's great. And I, I love what you said about how it was the first time that you realized you had a story to tell yourself. And I think Dungeons and Dragons really does open that up for a lot of people where we don't realize that everybody has the capacity to make a story. You know, obviously some people's will be better than others and blah, blah, blah. But, it, you know, we can all make a story and build from there. Uh, it's, it's a really good intro for that. And that's that's a nice way of putting it. I like that. Um, yeah, it's really true. It's it's really true. I, I think, uh, you know, I think more and more now that uh, D&D has gotten popular again, which is so fascinating to me as somebody who played back in the eight, you know, in 1880, uh -huh. we couldn't find anybody else to play. I mean, I remember for the, the next three years, Andy Cook, after that summer, he moved away, him and his brother moved away, and I had nobody to play with. And um, you, you couldn't find anyone who wanted to play D&D. So I remember for the next three years, I didn't play. I just read the books. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I bought the miniatures. I painted the miniatures. I memorized the modules. I subscribed to Dragon Magazine. I mean, I, my whole life was immersed in D&D, &D, even though I couldn't play it. Yeah, you were cocooning yourself so you could emerge a beautiful D&D encyclopedia yeah. butterfly yes. <laughs> yeah a little, little fairy dragon emerging yes. <laughs> so it was it was not until uh my freshman year of high school that i that i actually got a chance to play and dm uh after that first summer of you know of playing so um and i and i do it, it's so it's fascinating to me in this day when D, D has become popular where you can find people that play no problem um to see that so many creators in this era started out like me. They started out playing D and D, um, right. producers and authors and um, movie directors, and it, it was. I truly feel like it was for, formative for my journey as a creative person, and um, I think a key thing that led me to eventually becoming an author is that I was creating stories, playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And when you did get back to playing, I'm assuming that you started DMing. Was that your first time DMing or was that like right from the start, you guys kind of took turns or, or how did that look? No, Andy, Andy Cook's older brother didn't let anyone else DM. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, so it was my first time DMing. And by that point I had player's handbook memorized. I could quote page in scripture, verse number, you know, I mean, I had, I had, every episode of dragon magazine and all the updates and so um so uh i moved to a new town and uh and lucked into meeting some guys who play and i said hey do you play and they were like uh yeah do you dm and i'm like yes now I, I do. do now i do <laughs> <laughs> and from that that you know from then on we we played every single weekend uh and that was my first time dming and uh i i i loved it i loved dming more than i loved playing um, sure and uh and i've been dming off and on again ever since uh ever since that year yeah did you did you start out with uh pre-made modules yeah um you know i would say hybrid like like i had you know i was that freshman in high school who had the map of gray gray hawk on my wall and uh so i i it was a combination like i would play through some of the classics you know we play through keep on the borderlands we would when we got older higher levels we play through you know tomb of horrors and keep on the board um no um expedition of the barrier peaks and you know some of these great classic adventures but um i would make up some uh as well um in fact i remember um i wanted to create an entire city that was that was just an evil city that was populated by purely by monsters though a monster city and uh that my that my Good, lawful good adventurers had to you know go in and infiltrate and so i wound up creating that from scratch and uh and the other beautiful thing about back then is is dragon magazine came out every single month and uh it it almost always had some indie adventure in it sure um, some submitted adventure that they would publish and so 
if you were one of those rare people that subscribed to the magazine, you had you, you had this adventure, you know, that nobody else had had contact with and nobody else had read. So I used to I used to kind of combo and I still do combo written published stuff with um, strung together with homebrew stuff and kind of an amalgamation bits and pieces to to serve serve my needs. Sure. And and so I feel like I'm seeing some fifth edition books in the background. Um, have have yeah. you uh, progressed with each edition or, or what would that look like? Um, I played uh, pretty consistently into college. Um, and at that point, we were still playing first edition, even though I want to say at that point, second edition was out. Um, but just, you know, being a college student, like I didn't have the wherewithal to keep up with all sure. the at that point. So I remember playing through college and just, you know, DMing through some of the classic stuff that I had compiled over time and, and introducing a lot of new players as well as some people who had played in high school. Um, and then you graduate from college and then life happens. So, <laughs> so there was a, a season where I didn't play at all, um, where I would still read my books or I would still, you know, occasionally paint minis, but um, where I wasn't really actively playing and keeping up with all the, all the, um, all the new editions. So I was aware that that new editions were coming out. I was aware of third edition and 3.5 and, but it wasn't until fifth edition that I felt like, okay, I was at the point of life. My kids were a little older. Um, you know, I was established in my career. You know, I like, I felt like I had it for the first time in a couple of decades, a little bit of free time on my hands. Right. Right. So, um, so that was, yeah. So that was when I was like, okay, I think I want to get back into D and D uh, and fifth edition was out and man, it was a shock to my system. I'm sure. Really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I really had to pour through it and, and play a few games as a player to, uh, start to understand the mechanics and, and then, and, and to get to the place where I understand, stood them well enough to then decide whether I agreed or disagreed with them. Right. You know, yeah, I totally get that from the perspective of somebody who loves rules. There's definitely that feeling of like, anytime I play a new TTRPG, it's just like, do I like this? Like I, <laughs> I like maybe where I'm at in the setting and like the story, but do I like these rules at all? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really, uh, and especially being new to fifth edition, you know, when I first got into it and playing with people who all they knew was fifth edition, mm -hmm. you know, there was a little bit of that. You're not really allowed to argue with the rules because this is D and D. Right. And, um, and so I'm like, okay, okay, that's fair. That's fair. And um, so embracing fifth edition wholly and saying, okay, this is it. But then also feeling like there were certain things that mechanically were cumbersome and, things that i mean dnd &D to me the ultimate thing like 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 so much had progressed in fantasy since i played as a kid i mean world of warcraft was had had happened in that time frame right. and so i you know i think when fifth edition came out there was so much fourth and fifth edition i think so much emulating of okay the things that worked about video games and, mm -hmm. the things. and there was some of that that i liked but then i saw some of my players trying to play like it was world of warcraft and they're like no i need to be optimized right i, need right. To, I can't be a warlock unless i have eldritch blast and i'm like well but you could yeah you could <laughs> you don't have to be optimized right you can you can be the worst <laughs> warlock ever and, and maybe have more fun right so i i began to question some of the you know just some of the things that that I felt like maybe held me at our held us as a group at arm's length from the most immersive storytelling possible. Because mm -hmm. to me, that's what D and D is ultimately about. If I want to play World of Warcraft, I'll go play World of Warcraft. Right. Um, what D and D can do, like no video game, like nothing else out there, is immerse you in cooperative cooperative storytelling and right. and create tension. Like, um, like I don't like fifth edition um death saves i don't it, it's nobody dies no you know it's it's you should feel like you could die 
you really <laughs> should feel like you could die. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, that's one of my bigger gripes about fifth edition. It is really hard to kill a character. It is <laughs> like not that as I mostly DM. Not that I'm like specifically trying, but come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just find that when there is when players know the chances are slim for them to die, then there's no tension. And to me, that's the the death of good storytelling is you need, I mean, it goes back to writing, I guess, for me, but you need tension, you right. need conflict, you need to feel like you could die and um, at any moment. And um, so I, I think that's, you know, little things like that. Um, I, I do group initiative rather than individual initiative, just because I feel like individual initiative bogs down battle, it slows everything down. I want to feel the heat of the moment in battle. I want things to move crisp and quick. And sure. So anytime I, I find myself questioning a uh, a rule or a mechanic or something and deciding, okay, I'm going to homebrew it this way, or I'm going to borrow this back from first edition, or I'm going to twist it this way. It always is about, I, I try to not let it be about, well, this is how I played in the beginning because right. I'm original D and D. You know? <laughs> um, I try to make it about this is what will produce the most tension, mm -hmm. the most um, critical thinking, the most problem solving, the most teamwork having to do, um, and ultimately the best storytelling that leaves everyone, you know, at the end of the game feeling like, oh, that was exhilarating. Yeah, no, I totally get that. And uh, I feel like I noticed that I'm, I'm starting to notice it a lot more as the, I think, fifth edition matures a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. But seeing it, I feel a lot of influence from people who've been playing for decades and decades who are continuing that battle cry of, if you don't like it, change it. You know, mm -hmm. it's so easy to just use the rules or I guess to treat the rules as a modular thing and say, oh, I don't like death saving throws. So I'm going to change them in, in this way. And hey, that works for my table. Yep. And with the ability to kind of share that information a lot easier it's it's nice to see it kind of uh you know when when good changes happen other people can pick up on them and and move the game in the way that they want um I, out of i think I, go ahead i'm sorry oh, sorry just i was gonna say as a follow-up out of curiosity what did you do for death saving throws so um here's how i do death saving de death death or just is, death in general yeah that's yeah and death in general is is um when you get um to uh one hit point or below, you are unconscious. And you have three rounds to be stabilized by another party member. So that can include a heal, that can include bandaging, that can include, you know, a, a, a medicals check, whatever. And, um, and if nobody stabilizes, if somebody stabilizes you, regardless of what they cast on you, you come back up to one hit point. And you are conscious, but you're not able to enter into battle until you get more substantial. Um, because to me, that's realistic. If sure. you're mortally wounded, mm -hmm. you're not you coming back. Just, now, yeah. now I'm full capacity, and I yeah. um, that that doesn't feel real to me. That's video game logic in mm -hmm. my mind. So, so you are until you have time to get proper full healing you are at one hit point and you're and you're too weak to battle um if no one stabilizes you within three rounds then you roll against a um a death table that uh that i have borrowed from gosh where did i see this originally i think i saw it originally from professor dungeon master on dungeon craft he has a uh he has a uh, he's a great youtube guy to watch he, he he's a he's a little bit of that that clarion call for um old school renaissance um he he does a lot of rules that i really agree with homebrews and things that harken back to first edition and that i really agree with um and he has this really great chart um where you know you roll a d20 and and uh i i think like you know 11 to 20 or you know like 11 to 1 is death Mm -hmm. And and then so so like your chances are high at that point of you're dead right um but with various you know stages like okay if you roll a twenty you're, you're you know if you roll an eleven you get to you know give a a dramatic um 
death speech. Or sure, something. sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but um, if you roll, you know, if you roll worse numbers than that, you know, or better numbers than that, then you are maimed. So you can lose an arm, you can lose an ear, you can have a facial scarring that takes it takes your, you know, your charisma down by five points, you sure. can XYZ. So um, but but a good like 60% of the roles are you're dead. So it really is fascinating to me when we play that way, because um, especially when you're playing, I mean, when you're playing with new players, they, they don't know any difference, so it's fine. But when you're playing with players who have played at other tables that, that go by the book, that play rules is written, um, it ups the ante so significantly. And what I notice with my players is at first they they're scared to put themselves, I mean, they're scared to dive down a, 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 a kobold cave because, oh my gosh, we could die at the hands of kobolds. Mm -hmm. So it creates this timidity uh, at first, and then it creates, and then they rise to it, and it creates this heroicness in them where they're like, I feel badass because I could die, right? and right. my character could die, and we're now fifth level, and it's hard-earned, and, and, um, so it, it really, I find, adds a lot of dramatic tension to the gameplay and a lot of um, tough decision making mm -hmm. uh, because the stakes are real. The stakes are high. Right. They, they right. love these characters and nobody wants them to die. And if they do, then we'll figure it out. It's not like you're out of the game. You know, we'll bring you in as a new character. We'll figure it out. They know that. But nobody wants to die. And right. I think that's as it should be because your characters don't want to die either. Yeah, no, I definitely see that perspective. And I know that uh, one of my my co-hosts, Will, he often talks about how when he plays D&D, &D, he, he hates the idea of these like large dramatic backstories before you even come to the table, which I agree with to a, a pretty large extent. But it'd be nice if he put a hook in his backstory once or twice. Uh, but he often talks about how he wants it so that, yeah, everybody comes to the table with like a first level character and you die. And you die again until that one character rises above and becomes level uh, two and then level three and, you know, actually gets to continue their story because that makes it feel a lot more earned, um, yeah. which is, a, you know, rules is written. Fifth edition is not going for that at all. No, no. You start out as I am a superhero mm -hmm. right from the beginning. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely there's a it definitely plays into that ability that I am. I saw a graphic somewhere on, you know, where it's like fifth edition, you know, here's you at first level and you're, you know, gigantic pauldrons and sword t twice your height. And sure. And, and then here's you at 10th level and you look identical. Right, 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 right. Whereas, you know, other editions, it's like, here's you at first level and you you're, like like, a you're wearing a rag, <laughs> right. you've got like a, like a fork for a weapon. And <laughs> I'm like, that's kind of how it should be. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, obviously this, the, the stipulation is always going to be whatever works for your table works exactly. for your table. Uh, exactly. But no, I, I definitely see that perspective. And I think that's something that once people let get rid of the preconceived notion that your character is going to survive, you do get that feeling like you were talking about of, of feeling like a badass because you overcame things, not because uh, I guess the story told you you're a badass. Yeah. It, it, and it can be tricky, I find, with so many people playing, like when I, again, it's easy for me to think back to when I played in college or when I played in high school, because um, you have that reference point. And, and back, back then, you often were playing with people who had limited knowledge or less knowledge of the game than you did. Sure. You know, there was no internet. Nobody was looking up rules. If they didn't own the book, they didn't know. Right. And um and now, you know, so many people, I, I think it's a double-edged sword. So many people come into the game seeing it played on the internet or seeing, you know, while watching Critical Role or, you know, whatever it is um, that, that lures them in, which is this fantastic, beautiful thing that now you have more people playing d &D. Right, right. <laughs> but, but then it's a double-edged sword because you have all these people who saw it done one way and think that's the only way it can be done. Right. And they don't come into it with the perspective that this is a game that 
has rules as a base to guide gameplay, but that really plays different for every single table you sit at, for every group of people you come together. There's as many different ways to play it as there are DMs out there. And that can be hard to get players to overcome when they saw Matt Mercer do it this way. Why aren't you doing it this way? Or whatever it is, right. you know? Um, yeah, that's the double-edged sword of it being so popular now. Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, something that I think as I kind of hearkened to earlier, as fifth edition or even just D&D, the community kind of matures, I think we're seeing people moving away from that. And like, you know, the, the general consensus being, hey, you know, every table's different. And, yeah. you know, that's that's great. But there's still always going to be that that kind of hurdle, depending on where you came from. If you saw it somewhere else, you're going to have preconceived notions. And yeah, you know, those need to be uh, respectfully squashed early on. Yeah. Just like, look, this is going to be our game and it's going to be different. There's going to be parts that are better. There's going to be parts that are worse, but it's going to be ours. Yeah. I find that's really, that communication is really helpful. And I think you're absolutely right. I think, I think as um, DMs that have come to the game in this era are, are playing and they're realizing um, that people come to it with so much expectation and preconceived notions I think we're all just getting better at communicating. Like um, one of the first, you know, anytime I start a new campaign with a new group of players who have maybe never played with me before, we, we, we roll our characters together. We create our characters together and, and I do a, um, an expectations meeting. Like we, sure. we, we, we talk through things about here's, here's, here's some things I do and here's why and and it's a discussion it's like ask me questions challenge mm -hmm. me let's talk it out let's because ultimately i don't want to just do what works best for me um even though i kind of do want to do that but <laughs> <laughs> if i'm honest right. um but i, I do want to do what works best for the table and i want to i want to create the game that everyone sitting around it is going to have the most fun right so even like recently my campaign that we're running now um you know, they got this big epic quest to go and invade this um, this this ancient abandoned elvish mage school, um, but it's a long journey to get there. And so we had, you know, we had this discussion about if if you had your way, would you um, take the journey in real time and have awesome adventures along the way and and um, you know, have 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 all these side quests along the way that eventually lead you maybe to your destination, where by the end of it, you have, you know, done enough to pop a whole new level. Um, or B, would you, if you had your way, stumble upon a portal or a griffin that takes you there, you know, and, and so you can instantly start it. And uh, so it's, it's very interesting, you know, just the discussions you have. And I, I was debating with myself going, I could just decide this and maybe in days gone by, I would have just decided this, but um, but then I could just as easily make make a choice that flies in the face of the most fun for my players. And right. So I'm like, let's let's just decide this together. What, yeah. You know? And uh, and and to a person, everyone chose the journey, and that made me very happy because yeah, that's yeah, what I would have chosen. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I, I always have that issue with a lot of the. Uh, I mean, I, I can't even play uh, the, the pre-made modules anymore. I have like a, a very large hate for them because I've had bad experiences every time I try running them. Uh, but they often feel like after about like three or four levels, I know in Storm King's Thunder, that's a fifth edition one. They're like, here's an airship. Uh, now you can just travel across the entire continent with right. zero interactions. It's like, oh, OK, well, I guess the the travel section of this game is over. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. I think I have a I have a love hate relationship with some of the um, the fifth edition, you know, modules. Like I was I was looking through or is it Ghost of Salt Marsh recently, um, because I I have the original um, Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh module mm. from from first edition, and so I was very familiar with that, but I wasn't familiar with the whole campaign and how they do it now, where this book will take you from level one to level twelve all in one shot. And on one hand, that's cool. But on the other hand, I, 
I, I don't want to do all oceany adventures for 12 levels. Right. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to do all vampire uh, levels, you know, adventures for 12 levels. I right. want to go into lava pits and I yeah. want to go into <laughs> the ocean and I want to do some old school dungeon crawls and I want to have to storm a volcano. And I, yeah. you know, I, I want that variety in the game. So I think, I think some of the, what I love about that is the adaptability that I can just pluck this little, you know, adventure on a ship out of ghosts of salt marsh and use that for, you know, and, and pretty easily adapt it to whatever level I need it to be. And now we've got this ocean adventure and then I can, you know, take us to something completely different and it's and some other thing and, and, uh, and create the journey that, that we want to go on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think if I remember correctly, Salt Marsh did try to make it a little bit more modular where it's like, here's, you know, four or five adventures and you can play them in order. But I think the intent was to just like nab them for, you know, whatever section you liked. Um, and I've appreciated that they've at least uh, had a couple of, of books in that, in that uh, framing. Uh, all right. So. I did. I know we've talked a ton about your play style and everything, which is which is great. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your most recent work. So uh, you were mentioning that this is a uh, a book or I guess a series, whatever it, it turns out to be, uh, more geared towards say middle schoolers. I think is the the age range you're going for, as you mentioned, or yeah, later yeah. elementary. Yeah, it's later elementary, early, early middle school, I would say second through sixth grade is probably the target. Um, and uh, it is called, uh, it is called Fart Quest. And I'm showing it to him here, but he's, you know, you guys listening, uh, don't, don't see it. But, <laughs> but if you go and you look it up online, you'll, you'll see it. And uh, it is, uh, it is really, how it came about is a very interesting story. It's really my love letter to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, my editor, it doesn't always happen this way, but sometimes it does where my editor and I got together and we were brainstorming and we were talking about what do we want to work on next? What, what do we want to write together next? And it, again, it doesn't always often happen like that. Often I'm writing what I want and then I take it to them and either they're excited about it or they're not. And we figure out if, if it works for them and we go on. But, but um, my editor, Connie and I were really love loving working together. And so we said, let's brainstorm our next project together. And so we went round and round and, and, and they, we were talking about how some of her team had said, we'd love to do a full tilt potty humor book, like the Captain Underpants for the Next Generation. Sure. And I'm like, okay. You know, I mean, I wasn't thrilled. I wasn't super excited about just writing a, you know, a potty humor book. I was sure. like, okay, you know, I got nothing against potty humor. I love a good boop joke, but, <laughs> but, um, but I, I didn't want to just write a book that just that was what it was meant to be. That's all it was. So I'm like, all right, filed away, filed away. What else? Let's keep talking. And we landed on the realization that neither of us knew it at that point and that we both played D&D. &D. Oh, okay. And we started geeking out about D&D. &D. We started talking about all the campaigns we'd done and adventures we'd done. And uh, we were like, we need to do a fantasy, an epic fantasy Um adventure a D, D style um story and and i that i started to get excited about and then i paused and i said okay now you're talking my language what if we take both ideas and we combine them together what if we take this this idea of this epic awesome fantasy adventure and with my style of writing it's always going to be a comedy it's so it's always uh that's i like to laugh so it's going to be a funny book but then we also take this idea of a potty humor book and we smash them together. We could call it, and then we both set it at the exact same time, Fart Quest. <laughs> and and uh, the idea of Fart Quest was born. Um, but even as I got into it, I was really wrestling with this, this idea of how much fart and how much quest <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's i want i guess that potty humor is a is a piece of the book yeah and and it's definitely a key hook for the age group for sure sure what, sure. what uh you know what third grade kid doesn't want to uh read fart quest um but i 
I didn't want to live on the surface. I really wanted to find a, a group of young adventurers and, and and do very much what what I love to see happen in my campaigns, which is make them figure themselves out. Right. Make them have to rely on each other. That this is going to be taboo to say on this on this podcast of all podcast monsters and multi class. When I play D and D, I don't allow multi classing. That's okay. All right. You're wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. I'm prepared to be wrong. And not even um, from an optimization standpoint. But continue on. Continue on. And the reason I don't is because um, when you can do everything, uh, you don't need anyone else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a barbarian sorcerer, let's say, who can cast spells and hulk out, um, is great with melee and good at casting ranged spells. There's limited need to lean into one another, you know, and, and that's one of the things that I don't like about some video games like World of Warcraft is, you know, you play a paladin, you're OP, you're going to be, you know, you, there's some classes that are overpowered and there are other classes that are going to struggle. Right. I, I want when I play a game, I want my players to have to depend on one another. Sure. I want them to each bring a specialty to the game. I want the rogue to be able to do only things a rogue can do. I want um, the cleric to only be able to do things that that cleric can do. And, and so that was what I really wanted to bring into the story of Fart Quest is I want these young people to have to, they're brand new adventurers, but I want them to have to figure themselves out and figure out how they rely on one another to, to not only survive, but to grow as people. So the, so in my mind, this book has a ton of heart and that was very important for me. And I, my, my go-to catchphrase is um, behind the fart, there's a whole lot of heart. Uh, <laughs> and it's true. I do think it's true. I think it's easy for parents to look at a book like this and be like, oh, fart. I'm not, oh, I don't want my kid to read a fart book. Ugh, not another fart book. But it's it's not another fart book. It's yes, it's got that hook, but it's behind the fart. There's a whole lot of heart, and um, so that's that's the story I wanted to write. So um, it's about three adventurers, um, uh, a mage, uh, an apprentice mage named Bartok. Uh, his nickname is Fart, um, and you'll have to read the book to know how he gets that nickname and why. And then um, he has these two friends, uh, really strong, powerful girl characters which was very important to me. Um, I love living in the era where women play D and D man. When I was a freshman in high school, we couldn't find a girl to play D and D with us to save our lives. And so I love most of my current campaign. In fact, four out of five players are women. Uh, and I love it. I love playing with these strong, powerful women. And I really wanted um, this book to have strong, powerful girl characters. So fart is an apprentice mage, but he's got, uh, Pan Silver Snow, who is an elven monk, um, and uh, and then he's got uh, Moxie Battleborn, who is a dwarvish warrior, um, and so the three of them uh, they they go out to an adventure into the world, uh, accompanied by their masters, their their mage master, their monk master, and their warrior master, and the three masters die in a goblin attack gone horribly wrong, like early in the book, and. These three are left to decide, do we go back to our school where we were learning to tell them what happened? Or do we try this hero thing on our own? Maybe experience is the best teacher. I don't know. And so they decide to head out into the world and face monsters and baddies and wizards and everything on their own and uh, figuring themselves out and how to work as a team along the way. And, you know, I, I liked how you said that it's... Uh... You know, the hook, of course, is, you know, potty humor because, hey, that's that's the demographic and they're going to love that. Um, but I feel like when I was that age and and reading books like that, uh, you know, your Captain Underpants and whatnot, I definitely don't remember there being much in the way of an underlying story and any like character growth. It was silly and and fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love that idea of a, a kid's book that's not afraid to even I mean it sounds like tackling some I'll say even a, a darker topic of of death it sounds like pretty early on and you know what to do with that kind of responsibility and whatnot um that's that's really interesting 
Yeah, it is. I mean, all that fun and silliness is there. There's layers of that for sure. Of course. But you're right. You're right. It, there, There is a depth to it that, uh, you know, I mean, a big, a big part of Fart's journey is, um, you know, he's a goofball. And back at, at Kraken Top Academy for Heroes, where they started, um, all the other mages, mage apprentices are super serious and bookish and, and he's kind of a chunky kid and all the mages are super skinny and you know you know and um so along the way he learns to not only embrace his curves and embrace who he is but but embrace even the name fart um which he gets because of a goofball bonehead decision uh when he chooses his first spell he chooses not the most powerful, not the most optimized. He doesn't choose Eldritch Blast. He chooses the funniest spell. He chooses uh, a spell called Gas Attack, which, you know, basically turns your enemy into a, a fart cloud. Okay. He, he doesn't choose it because it's powerful. He chooses it because farts are funny. Right. And so his master goes on to nickname him Fart for that in a derisive, you know, way. But, um, he comes to embrace that name later when they're ready to call him Bartok the Brilliant. Um, he's like, no, I'm fart. I'm fart. And he's good. He's good being the goofball mage that he is. Right. Um, so, yeah. So there's good, there's good meat there. And I, I hope it's the kind of book that D and D loving parents will grab and say, man, great intro to, to fantasy, to D and D, to role playing, to tabletop games for my kid. Um, because it really is, it really introduces a lot of the tropes and, um, there's a lot of little, just very subtle, no one would get them if they weren't looking for them, but little just callbacks, homages to keep on the borderlands and tomb of horrors and classic, you know, pit traps and riddles that need to be solved. And, you know, so a lot of those very wonderful classic fantasy tropes and D&D tropes um, are in there to be found, which I, I hope will will not only excite kids as a book and parents for reading them reading the book, but but maybe even be a, a bridge into tabletop and role playing games. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the parents I know are looking for those types of uh, connections. I mean, I just had my uh, my my manager at my real person job uh, tell me that you know she got a new game that is with the specific intent of getting her kids into Dungeons and Dragons and getting into tabletops. Um, so I think a lot of parents are are looking for that because it's something that yeah everyone's loved for years and years and years, and you want to share that with your kids and and get them uh, understanding what's so great about it. Yeah. Uh, so I I love that idea and I. I you know, appreciate, I'm sure I would miss every single reference of, of <laughs> <laughs> older modules. Cause I never touched them uh, yeah. as much as I'd like to, I, I feel like I've heard way too much about keep on the borderlands to just like <laughs> never play it, but we'll see if I ever get the opportunity. Um, but yeah, regardless, that's uh, yeah, just a, a great, great way to keep the parents entertained and, you know, mm -hmm. just spotting those references and such. Yeah, um, it's a great read aloud. I mean, the whole series is it's a great book too is out now. Oh, um, perfect. It's called it's called The Barf of the Bedazzler, uh, where Pan and Moxie and Fart go on a uh a uh quest to find a a rare, dangerous creature known as a bedazzler. Um, and we'll just say, you know, uh it has it, it's a floating ball that has one eye and beams that shoot out of gemstones on its head. So um while still honoring copyright laws. <laughs> uh, the real uh, important part. <laughs> so, but they have to retrieve uh, a rare and precious object from it. It's barf. So again, you've got that that very fun, goofy, disgusting hook, but um, you know, it takes their characters to a whole new level. And my, and my hope is that not only will it be, you know, great for kids to read those younger kids second grade you know even first grade it's a great read aloud to to mom mom and dad to read you know with their kids at bedtime right. or whatever but it's also i think an age appropriate and safe entry point you know I, there's a big a lot of big discussion right now which i think is really good discussion happening in the miniatures world and in the 3d printing world which i'm a part of um 
about you know the over sexualization of of women and fantasy characters you know and miniatures specifically yeah <laughs> and and i know a lot of parents i'll see this in in my face group uh groups and and 3d print groups and stuff a lot of parents are like i want to play with my kids but everything is you know boobies and you know it, it, it's all so sexualized and how, how do i put this mini in front of my daughter and say here's who you are and you know in a safe and accessible way um so it, it it's these are, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a age appropriate, safe entry point that also models things like strong girl characters and a warrior who's amazing. You know, she's Moxie is amazing with her warhammer and amazing with her shield, but truly her most powerful weapon is her vast knowledge of anything related to a monster. The girl knows monsters inside and out. And not only as a writer, is does that give me a mechanism to then inform the reader about monsters right. they might not know about? Right. But um, but that it, it's rooted in who her character is. She she's bookish in that way, as long as it has to do with monsters, and that becomes one of her most powerful weapons is her knowledge of right. monsters. So anyway. Yeah, I'm excited. Book three comes out in uh, September. It's called Far Quest Three: The Dragon's Dookie. <laughs> You're welcome. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> Love the alliterations. Yep. And then Far Quest Four comes out uh, next spring, and it's called The Trolls Toe Cheese. So awesome. lots of uh, lots of fartastic, uh, disgusting, body humor oriented uh, quests lay ahead for these these three. That's great. And I love that there's so many more coming out. Sounds like it's going to be a, a fun series. Yeah, um, for sure. The way I like to kind of wrap things up, because I know we're getting close to our allotted time here. Don't want to take up too much of your Saturday morning. I'm sure you've sure. got minis to paint and writing to write. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I just like to kind of turn things over to you. I've asked a, a whole bunch of questions. Is there anything that you just want to talk about and say to the world of listeners? <laughs> Gosh, that's a lot of pressure. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> that's why I like throwing it at people. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think the things I would want to say are are known by the people who are listening to this. Um, you know, it, it makes me like I grew up in the era where D and D had the stigma. It was like, oh my gosh, there's a devil on the cover of that book. Um, and, you know, back in the 80s, there was this whole, uh, you know, Satanism scare. It's, you know, and it boggles my mind that I'll still come across parents that have that idea of what d d is. That they'll mm -hmm. think, oh, it's, that's bad. I'll, I'll, mm, you shouldn't be doing that and talking about that with kids. And um, I, I think most people who are listening to this aren't in that camp. Um, right. I would but, hope not. But if you did stumble into this show and you are one of those parents, uh, l let me know, because I just want to I want to have a satanic panic or say, yeah, satanic panic parent on the show. That would be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Just to, just to understand where did they where did you get that idea? Right. You no. Know? And how much do you actually know? Have you ever played it or, or is it just a fear thing? Because right. um, it, 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 it's it's truly the single biggest thing I can point to both in my childhood and in my adult life that has stimulated my imagination, that has fostered creativity, that is, I, and I am thankful that I had parents that didn't freak out about it. They let me play D and D all I wanted and they bought me all the books for Christmas and all the minis. And um, th there is nothing like this game. Um, no video game. I, I, I'm, I used to be a huge video gamer as well and still do on occasion, but there's no video game like this game. There is no game like this game where you are inventing this epic fantasy adventure and journeying through it as a character and, and creating the world around you. And uh, it is, it is ab absolutely a boot camp of creativity. And um, I think every every kid should play Dungeons and Dragons um, and read Fart Quest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every kid should do two things. Two yes, things. Two First things thing. in life. 
<laughs> play your Dungeons and Dragons, get all the books, and also read Fart Quest. <laughs> One and I'm two. And- say, I'm not going to say that's going to make your kid a better person in life, <laughs> but it might. <laughs> the important thing is it won't make them worse. So, no, hey, you no, know. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, well, good advice all around. And uh, I, I think it is, it's going to be really interesting over the next. I'll even say decade here as more and more people get their kids and, and young adults into D and D and use it as a, a learning tool, which I have seen a lot. I've tried doing myself, even with my, uh, my niece and it's, uh, there's a lot to D and D that I, I love about, uh, and, and what is it? How do I want to phrase that? There's a lot of D and D that I love and want to share with children because I think it's really helpful in their growth and development. Absolutely. Critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, let alone just the imagination side of it. Of, yeah. You know, living in this fantasy world and playing these characters, there's just so much good to be figured out and explored within this game. Um, yeah. Man, I can't. I'll even throw teamwork onto there. Uh, following rules to some extent, yep. you know, <laughs> yep. sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> uh, well, great. Hey, Aaron, thanks so much for coming on. This was a great time. Uh, before we uh, close out here, do you want to tell people where they can find you, find your work? Is there, there any specific direction to point? Yeah. Uh, you can find me on my website. It's Aaron-Reynolds.com. That's a that's a hyphen, Aaron-Reynolds.com. And I'll have a link uh, wherever, you know, people can find yeah. links. And you can, uh, you you know, anywhere you buy books, you'll find my books. Um, uh, I encourage people to uh, shop with their indie their indie bookstores uh, because while uh, that 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 gigantic uh, bookstore in the sky that we have out there on the internet is a, a wonderful convenience and by me all means get your books there if that's uh, where you want to go then um, but uh, indie bookstores are a fantastic goldmine of people who love books selling books and uh, they're an endangered species so if we don't support them then they're not going to be around so it's my plug for indie bookstores. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for, for coming on, everybody. Find Aaron's work either at your local bookstore or AaronReynolds.com, the dash. Again, I'll have a link. Uh, and otherwise, thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Jared.